All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I think it's close enough to 1230. Um, might as well kick it off. So I had an idea a little while ago. I was talking to somebody, uh, one of the viewers, and they said that they uh, really enjoyed the stream. And one of the they were using the stream as kind of their guideline on how to, you know, pop, hack the box and like uh, PWK boxes, like lab boxes and stuff. And um, you know I, that was that was very nice, and I, I like to hear that kind of stuff. But what I realized is that I don't really have any um, how-to uh, kind of method videos. I have a lot of me just kind of bumbling around and you know guessing at what'll work, and either it does or it doesn't. We try something new or you know whatever. But I think it'd be good if we had some actual some process videos to kind of go over how things are generally done and, and kind of the rough order of things, tools that we use in each phase and stuff like that. So I plan on doing a series of these, hopefully more often than once a month, like my <laughs> usual cadence, maybe once a week or once every other week. But I'm going to start off with recon because it's the first phase. It's an important phase. Uh, and I, I see, and, and I'm, I get lazy too, but I see a lot of people just kind of like throw end maps at something and then start, um, you know, hacking around. But there's actually a lot of tools that we can use for various things. Um, but they each have, you know, some quirks and some ramifications and, and we need to kind of be... Um, judicious when we come in with these kind of tools because not everything uh, you know is is prudent it's it's not always prudent to use every tool so uh, with that we're gonna jump right into it there's two uh, kind of halves of recon um, the first half is uh, passive there's passive recon where you kind of gather information about a target without actually touching it without you know generating a log or anything like that and then there's the other half is active uh, recon, which you start actually touching the target systems or the target companies. And, um, you know, you start generating logs. They're then aware of you, whether or not they're paying attention to you or not uh, is, is something else entirely. But they have the capability of knowing that you're there. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started with some stuff. Um, first off, I want to say, so, you know, as with anything, even with recon, um, don't do anything that you don't have permission to do or, uh, you know, attack a target that you don't have permission to uh, attack. So um, for the for some of the passive stuff and most of the recon stuff, um, I just picked, uh, I went to Hacker One and found some places that have bug bounties. Uh, CrowdStrike has a bug bounty. They have a fairly wide scope. Most of the recon stuff that we're going to be doing uh, uh, that we're going to be doing today um, is mostly web stuff, so getting information about uh, you know their web presence or their their perimeter. Um, so this is a good one in any. So we'll we'll be learning about um, CrowdStrike as we as we move forward today. Uh, Dutch Coast asks, are these steps from the Assuring Security by Penetration Testing book? Um, they're probably similar. Uh, you know, each book in each class. Uh, talks about various phases of penetration testing. Uh, I'm not following any one book. I, I'm kind of going, you know, just in the the uh, process that I use is generally uh, recon, uh, exploitation, enumeration, you know, privilege escalation, enumeration. In that rough order, those are those are the the steps that we're going to be uh, going through. Is too low. The video resolution is too low. Is what I'm getting. Um, is it not 1080p? It should be 1080p. We have some technical difficulties, perhaps. It's fine for me. Video resolution is too low. Yeah, and maybe maybe you're not. Uh, maybe you're not. Like you have to go to the little cog and make sure that it's set for 1080p. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm broadcasting at 1080p, but it, it will downsample for you if you don't have the uh, the bandwidth to watch that. Okay, so yeah, so so that's that's kind of the processes processes that we're gonna follow is you know uh, recon phase, um, you know exploitation phase, enumeration, uh, then privilege escalation, and then after that it's just a you know um, enumeration pivot exploit enumeration pivot exploit over and over again until you reach whatever goal or whatever flag you're trying to get um so 
so yeah, we're going to be learning about CrowdStrike today. Uh, no particular reason. They just happen to be on the first page of Hacker One, and they, like I said, they have a pretty wide scope. We're not going to be doing any actual penetration tests, like actual infiltration of their systems. So you know, some casual recon, I think, will be fine. So <clears throat> uh, with that, first things first, uh, we're going to a lot of passive uh, recon is about using information that <clears throat> other people have already um, collected about the target, right? So there are services out there and, and databases out there that collect information either by scanning uh, the internet or, you know, collecting registration information. Uh, <clears throat> so we can access that information uh, without actually touching the target organization basically for free, right? So <clears throat> the, the first one I like to do is who is uh, for systems administrators and, you know, people who've been in technology for a while, this is starting off kind of slow, but this is a very important tool. This is something that can give us a lot of information about an organization. So for instance, if we do who is CrowdStrike, uh, can't type .com. So and Tmux, so we can't scroll, but so <clears throat> you can see the kind of information that we should be getting out of here, right? So there's, uh, you know, we should be getting uh, street addresses, we should be getting contact emails, uh, we should get uh, contact names, all of that stuff. But CrowdStrike, as with many uh, people out there, use um, <clears throat> like a who is uh, uh, like a who is obfuscation service, basically, so that you can't do exactly what we're trying to do right now, right? Um, they don't necessarily want us just by running a simple who is uh, query to find out their uh, phone numbers and names and, and email addresses and stuff like that because we can use those for social engineering attacks, which is pretty much what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to find this information so we can leverage it for further attacks. <clears throat> Excuse me, I, I, my throat's a little weird today. Sorry about the, the voice quality. <clears throat> so um the uh uh what was i gonna say the um yeah so so these guys are obfuscated um you can do uh i used to work for uh sketchers so this is all public information right but i used to work for sketchers the shoe company and um, um they kind of take a, a halfway approach right so um if you look Oh, here we go. If you look, um, they don't give out actual names and email addresses. They use, you know, hostmaster at sketchers.com as their uh, email address. They don't set specific phone numbers. Oh, here's a phone number. Um, but uh, it does give you, you know, their address uh, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, this could be useful uh, if we're uh, contracted for a... Um, um, for like a physical pen test or, or something to that effect, uh, this could be useful information for us. So again, who is, it's not a wealth of information and, and a lot of companies do have things obfuscated, but uh, it's a quick, it's a quick win. It can get us some quick information without actually touching the organization. So uh, another one that can give us some information about their, their web presence um, is a website called cert.sh. And so what this is, is this is basically uh, certificate registration information. And we can, by analyzing the certificates that exist for certain domains, we can use this to start enumerating um, uh, subdomains and, and other hosts on their network, uh, again, without actually touching their, their environment, right? So to use CrowdStrike, for example, if you notice here, there's a uh, they use the percent sign for a wildcard. So we'll just do percent.crowdstrike.com and run this. And it'll take a minute, well, not a minute, I guess. But sometimes, like if you do that for Google, it'll take like a couple minutes to compile all the information for you. But you can see it gives us this neat little, uh, this nice little output here. And it shows us all these hosts and subdomains that are on there. Um, on their network, or at least as part of CrowdStrike.com, right? 
In addition, we can get some information about the certs if, if we need that for some reason later, but this is kind of the biggest piece of information. Also notice that uh, they give us a neat little, uh, it's just a get request, so you can automate this, you know, either using curl or uh, I'm pretty sure there's, um, if we go searching for SH Python, yeah, there's several people who have written like Python APIs and uh, uh, Python clients to, to automate using this site. But again, this gives us a lot of information about, you know, various, like where, what their IMAP host name is, what their mail host name is. They've got, you know, pop probably. Um, they've got something about Intel. There's a host name called Yak. There's a support portal, uh, all kinds of stuff. And, and, through more active uh, uh, recon, we can figure out a little more about what they are, um, you know, and what their use is. But, you know, catting this out to a file or saving this to a file, it can be pretty useful later on when we start, like, more enumeration, like service enumeration and stuff. Um, so another one that I like to use, especially if we're, oops, um, Another one that I like to use, especially if we're doing a physical uh, engagement or like we're visiting the site or whatever, um, is, is just use Google Maps. And if we look for CrowdStrike, kind of already knew that it was in Orange County, right? So we've got this, um, we've got a kind of a layout of what their site will look like. Um, we notice that they're on a shared campus. Um, you know, it looks like a walking campus. There's a couple roads here, but it's a walking campus. So we can do things like, um, you know, hang out at this park and just kind of observe uh, their building for a little while, see the habits of um, employees, you know, where's their smoking area? Do they typically let, uh, um, do they typically let people um, uh like piggyback in? Do they, you know, do they hold doors open for visitors, et cetera? <laughs> yeah, there's a, um, <laughs> a company named Weed Maps. I, I don't know what that is, but I'm sure it has something to do with delivery weed. Welcome to California. Um, but uh, this is this is interesting intel, right? And I don't know. Do, do we have a? Uh, so we can do a street view. Um, we can do kind of a street view walk around their the campus, right? And just kind of take a look at what it looks like without even visiting. Again, this is all passive. Nobody, uh, um, you know, I haven't visited there. Nobody, nobody but the Google car has visited here, but we can still get, you know, some visual information about this. And we could, I could spend time walking around this and kind of zooming in and zooming out and seeing what we could find. Uh, but we don't necessarily need to. But anyway, so this is a good passive recon again for physical activities and recently i don't know if you all have heard about this uh but there was a, a company named strava that is like a fitness app and they just released all of their um the, the quote unquote anonymized right um walking data and so if you zoom out like it just looks like a population density map of of the us or wherever we go right but if we zoom in oops I zoomed in probably a little too far the scroll wheel is very sensitive in this. So if we start zooming in, and I live in Southern California, so I know this area a little bit, but we start zooming in and we start looking at, um, we just, we want just walking data. Um, we want some labels so we kind of know where everything is, right? Um, we can start looking at, like there's Oceanside, this place is in, um, uh, up in Irvine, right? So we can start like zooming into Irvine and finding where they are and actually get start getting uh, walking data for that area for, um, for uh, you know, their building even, stuff like that. And Dutch Ghost points out that you can spot military stuff. And that was actually my very next point. So spot on, uh, you can. So this is a military base um, here in Southern California, pretty big one. And um you can absolutely see all the different, you know, walking paths that people take, uh, you know, the random stuff out here in the middle of nowhere that has a big heat map. So either that's a uh, PT route that they make soldiers run around, or that could be a, uh, a uh, 
patrol route or who knows who knows what this is but with a little more uh recon you can you know probably find out and start extrapolating data and making guesses but again this is a this is the strava heat map is is very interesting uh it's less interesting here in irvine you know in orange county there's a lot of stuff um but if you have like a, a facility that you're doing a pen test for that's out in the middle of nowhere say like here uh you can start figuring out you know like what are these things why are these people walking around what you know people spend a lot of time here maybe being over here would be a better place to observe things without getting caught all kinds of stuff this is this is a wealth of information there was a lot of fallout uh when this got released on the infosec twitter and uh, i think rightly so is it's, it's kind of crazy that that we have access to this information now like freely so um yeah, so so that's that's Google Maps slash map like uh, functionality that we can learn. There's also a thing called Google dorking or Google hacking is another name for it, but it's basically using advanced um, Google searches, advanced Google search syntax to kind of find more information about something. So as a as a quick example, you could do something like, and I always have to look this up, but maybe I can just guess uh, if we do a um, uh let's see in url um we'll do crowdstrike uh and then we want to do like is it doc type pdf mm. Oh, this is where I was going to go next anyways. So um, we'll go back to this and or we'll explain what this stuff is supposed to be uh, as we go through this. So their exploit database, uh, if you're not familiar, it's just a big database of exploits and shell codes and various other things. It's maintained by the folks over at Offensive Security that run the penetration testing with Kali Linux, uh, the OSCP, OSCE, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but this is a database full of these Google hacks that I was talking about, uh, where you can do um, Google searches to find information about specific uh, devices. Um, this would be some kind of fingerprint for a, a very specific device that has a vulnerability of some sort, right? So if we click on this. Um, so an IDC file manager. Um, a secure multi-user web-based file management service. So you can tell that it's that type that is likely that type of a server because it has this specific um, file structure to it and it's got a manager.pl at the end and so this might pick up some extra stuff but it might likely won't and you tend to want to have your google dorks be very specific for that reason right you want a specific title uh, so you can do in title and then set what the title of the website should be um, you should find PHP in the text of the file and in the URL should be this file path, the stat sysinfo.php. So if you're looking for specific, um, you know, vulnerable software inside of a customer's site, um, you know, you know that they use uh, WordPress, for example, but you don't know if they're using a specific plugin, you can find a, a either a file path or uh, a string fingerprint that you can search against their website for uh, and look for in URL, in title, um, in text, stuff like that. So there's there's also a file, is it file type? Uh, this is why you test stuff before you. Yeah, so, so it's file type, not doc type. So if you do file type PDF, I basically just search for all PDFs that, are, that exist on CrowdStrike's website. Now, this is going to be a bunch of press releases and security blogs and all of that because CrowdStrike is a reasonably security. I mean, they're, they're, they're a security, security company. They're conscious about this kind of stuff. Uh, and we're not here to actually do a bug bounty against them right now. But there's plenty of PDFs coming through here. But what if we did something like, you know, um, ultramegacorp.com and then the file type was .xls or, you know, xlsx. Or something like that and we pull up a bunch of publicly hosted excel spreadsheets that weren't supposed to be publicly hosted right a lot of, there's a lot of data leakage like that out there um that for us to to kind of find and and explore now one thing 
I do want to say about this um, from a active versus passive recon perspective. Um, this is act or this is passive recon, right? Just doing a Google search. Google is the one that spidered all these sites. They're the ones that show up in the customers' logs. Um, we haven't done anything yet. As soon as we click that, that is now active recon. We're now actually looking at stuff. Uh, we we show up on their logs. We show up on their web access logs, right? So if you're conscious about these things, if you're uh, you know very specifically in a passive recon mode, uh, you want to make sure and you want to think before you do something, is this going to show up on their logs? Uh, am I going to trip uh, some kind of sensor or you know, are they going to notice we're there? Um, I've seen companies require specific uh, IP addresses from testing uh, firms to say, you know, specifically which IP addresses are you coming from? And that's for, you know, that's good because they're generally like letting you through the firewall or they're letting you VPN or, you know, locking something down so that only you can access this potentially vulnerable software and no one else can. I get it. But sometimes IT uh, staff get a little overzealous. Uh, they view a penetration test as a uh, competition. And so if they get a hold of those testing IPs, they'll actually throw those IPs right into their IDS, right? Um, so uh, you know, the, and it'll trigger every time you visit their site. So I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm not passing judgment on those IT teams, but if you're trying to be stealthy for an engagement, it's important to think about how this stuff works. Uh, now, pseudo man man um, rightly pointed out that you can do browsing in cache mode, so you can view uh, the cached document um, specifically from um, from Google. Now that'll work for uh, HTML, and it'll it'll work for this PDF. But you can tell that like it's not like formatted correctly. It's a, it's a, it's not the actual document that you're looking at. Um, this is useful for viewing content. Uh, it might not be 100% useful for your purposes, but uh, pseudo man man is absolutely correct. Uh, this is going through Google's um, servers. It is not hitting the actual customer server. So uh, good call out there. Cached mode is definitely a way to, to keep things passive. So uh, the last thing in passive, uh, and this, I mean, passive is kind of the, the faster one because we're just like throwing up search results. Um, active will have some actual commands uh, being ran, so that'll take a little more time. But the last thing I want to do in passive is um, Shodan. So we're not going to go super deep into Shodan. Shodan is, is an amazing tool. There is a ton of stuff you can do with it. It would warrant its own, um, you know, multi-part, uh, video series just to kind of get into all the neat stuff you can do with it. Uh, but it's important to know that Shodan exists. Uh, it's important to know um, that there's a free and a um, paid version of Shodan. Basically, the difference between the two is that the free uh, version will give you one um, page of results. The paid version will give you access to their APIs and will give you, um, they call them like API credits or something like that, but it'll give you access to more results and the ability to automate searches and, and stuff like that. Um, I'm not going to sign into my account. Um, one thing to know is in the holidays, they tend to, I think uh, Black Friday and a couple other um, holidays, they are sales, we'll call them sales holidays because Black Friday is not really a holiday, but um, they, they usually have, like I bought my uh, Shodan account for like $5 and it was like a lifetime membership. So keep an eye out uh, for sales, but um, it's it's good to go. It's good to know. So you can do stuff like, um, you know, you can just search for, you know, CrowdStrike, you know, like a normal search engine. Uh, and it'll give you... Um, Oh, so it will not look for CrowdStrike.com, right? This isn't this isn't like Google. Uh, what it does do is it searches it searches content, it searches headers, it'll search open ports, uh, it'll search uh, service um, fingerprinting results. Uh, if you notice here that it's coming up with some Venom vulnerability in some web server in China, but What's actually happening is it's actually triggering on a cookie. There's a cookie here, a domain cookie, um, that has CrowdStrike.com in it. You'll notice a lot of these. 
what's cool about that and what's this what this is actually indicating is that we can do a full search on uh, basically anything we can say I want cookies that match this I want uh, HTTP headers that match that uh, I want only things running on specific ports I want um, only services that identify as RDP you have all of this functionality inside of uh, Shodan and it's fully uh, API accessible. Um, you can, you know, script this, automate this. You can use it for um, threat intelligence on your own organization, uh, just to see if like things pop up that you weren't expecting to pop up. Um, you can, you know, obviously use this for passive uh, uh, recon on a client. Again, this is all Shodan doing the crawling for you. Uh, they have their own. Um, there's a, there's a few papers out there that you can read, but they have their own kind of mass scan um, type of, of internet scan where they're constantly scanning the entire internet. So they're the ones doing the active recon for you and you can reap the, the results uh, pretty easily and without touching your, uh, again, your, your target organization. So again, I'm not gonna go super deep into Shodan because this is a very deep talk, topic in and of itself. Um, I believe there's a SANS, uh, let's see. I believe there's a SANS uh, article that maybe Josh Wright wrote um, about Shodan. Um, let's see. Getting the most out of Shodan searches. Yeah, Josh Wright and Jeff McJunkin uh, wrote this um, kind of how to use Shodan and, and various ways to. Uh, you know, search and the different types of searches you can do. So you can do a search for, you know, the title of a, of a thing and, um, you know, the ports or not ports, right? So it, the title is Outlook Web Access. They're looking for OA interfaces, but on non-standard ports, right? Things that are not on 443 or 80 to try and find, you know, maybe some dev instances or, or uh, you know, test instances of OA. Um, so anyways, this is a great article. I highly recommend you check it out and read it as kind of your introduction to Shodan. Um, Danny2k says, it's a great way to get username on window boxes if you're using the image search. Yeah, so there's there's a site, and I'm not going to Google for it now, but there's a, there's a site that basically crawled Shodan looking for RDP and VNC uh, instances, and it has just a ton of screenshots of all the different VNC and RDP instances it found. And so you can see a lot of crazy stuff. There's some like, um, there's like a crematorium ICS interface, uh, which is crazy. Um, there's a, a lot of desktops and, and various things. So you can, you can enumerate usernames uh, to IP addresses, um, all kind of, you know, ID, uh, uh, OS versions and stuff like that. So sometimes you'll you'll hit it big if you find a, an IP range for a for a client and you find that they're running VNC like on, on the internet, then uh, that's huge. Um, Teddy two K, yes, the functionality is in Shodan. Uh, the site that I'm referring to is just like a um, it's a it's a project that somebody did where they crawled Shodan and and made their own um, image gallery of it. Um, Dutch Ghost, you probably get this question a lot, but what OS do you prefer for things like this and um, to do some development on tools? Uh, I use Kali uh, just because it comes with most of the tools that I, I expect to use. Um, I tend not to do too much crazy configuration because I find that if I jump on someone else's box or you know I get in and I'm in the middle of pivoting or various situations, you don't always have access to like your custom configuration. So I tend to use just vanilla Kali and then I'll load you know some some tools onto it that make my life easier. Um, it, it has you know Python and Ruby and Go and and all that stuff in it, so I don't have to you know do anything crazy to configure um, to do any tool development. Pretty much all the tools I write are in Python anyways, so that's, you know, easy, but uh, pretty much Kali, just because it's easy and it's it's full featured. I like apt, so, um, you know, there's a there's a dark arch or something like that I've heard about recently um, that's like a pen testing platform built off of Arch Linux. Um, I'm not an arch person, so, um, you know, I don't use it, but... Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's good too. Really, as long as you're using a Linux, you can get the tool, the common tools running pretty easily. So it really just comes down to what uh, platform is 
makes things uh, the smoothest for you, the most efficient, less friction. Uh, and for me, that's been Kali so far. So, okay. Um, now we're going to uh, move on to active uh, active recon now. So, the first thing um, the first thing we're going to talk about, much like we started with who is on the passive recon side, um, we're going to jump into a tool called Dig just for some DNS. Um, enumeration and um, dig will give us uh, you know it'll resolve host names to IP addresses it might give us some some you know subdomains or uh, more IP addresses than we knew existed stuff like that so we'll go ahead and do um, so so dig is just a, a like a DNS tool so we'll do a, a CrowdStrike and so if you see here um, for CrowdStrike.com, uh, there's two IP addresses um, that respond for, uh, that will respond to it. There's uh, 104.20.95.246, 104.20.94.246. Uh, if you do this for Google, you'll see a ton more. Uh, oh, it, it doesn't show all of them. There's a, um, let's see. There's a switch that'll show all of them rather than just one at a time. Because this is just the the one responding. So uh, dig DNS. Um, dig A. Oh, 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 because I'm using my, right, because I'm using my internal one. So if we do, why? They must have changed the way they respond. Must have changed that. Yeah, they must have changed that. So um, let's just uh, let's talk a little bit about what I was just doing. So there's a couple things here. We had a plus short flag, which changed the output to not have all of the extra stuff to it. Um, so it just gives you the IP address. This is good for scripting. Um, you know, if you if you're just wanting to grab IP addresses and you don't want to like grep and sort and all this stuff, uh, another bit of syntax that we have here is the A, and this is just asking for A records, no C names, etc. Uh, and then the at and an IP address is telling Dig which DNS server I'm wanting to um, that I'm wanting to query. So either my local DNS server or 8.8.8.8 um, .8 is one of Google's DNS servers. Uh, there's thousands of dns servers on the internet so you can if you you know know one specifically you can target it and uh, request the information this is good to know like if you're internal to a client site and uh, you want to use their dns server we'll probably have more information about their um, their environment than say google will uh, so you'll want to change that to whatever their dns server is in a windows environment dns is typically handled by the uh, active directory server um, so you can point it directly at the domain controller, uh, and it'll help you um, get that get that information. Uh, real quick, I saw somebody else uh, posted. So Dutch Ghost uh, says, "I'm thinking of switching from Windows to just native Kali, working with VMs currently to do that, but it's a pain, and the speed of the VMs isn't great." So I don't know if I would move to Kali for my primary, like for my primary. Um, it, there's there's a lot of complications there, but to get Kali working like a normal distribution is a little difficult. Um, Kali, you know, you can create users on Kali so that you're not always running as root, but it it's just it, it's it's a little weird. It's you're forcing uh, um, a specific tool built for something specific to do a, a lot of generic things, and I'm not sure that's a good use of your time. 
Uh, most pen testers, as, I, as far as I know, and offensive researchers and pretty much everybody in the security industry does what you're describing now, which is use VMs to kind of, you know, have your, your various um, your various toolboxes, you know, your Kali's or your Remnux or your, you know, um, whatever your forensics toolkit is or whatever. Uh, and that does a lot of things. But the biggest thing it does is it keeps things separate. Uh, it allows you to do um, versioning and snapshotting on your VMs. If you're working for a client, um, it has everything inside of a VM. And then so when you're done with that client, you can zip up that VM, hand it to them, be like, this is literally everything I did for you. Uh, none of your data exists anywhere else. And then you can delete the VM off your computer. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of good things about using VMs um, to do that. Um, the other thing is it gives you sandboxes. So you can, you know, kind of sandbox a VM and, and work on malicious things inside of it without risking, you know, your normal files on your desktop. Um, Null pixels asking, what about dual booting? Uh, dual booting is another way to do it, but really I've found over time that rebooting and flipping back and forth between operating systems is a pain in the ass. So um, you can dual boot, I suppose, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, I, I bet the friction of that would be pretty high after a while. Um, let's see. Oh, another thing about using... Um, uh, using VMware as, or at any virtual machine thing is that um, it allows you to use multiple operating systems at the same time. So sometimes there you need a Windows tool or sometimes you need a OSX tool or, you know, you need to run a Windows binary or an OSX binary and, you know, um, doing the, uh, uh, like the emulation or the, the abstraction layers uh, don't work as well. So that's pretty good. Um, running an AWS is another thing. So Danny 2K asks about running an AWS. <clears throat> you can run stuff in AWS as test boxes. Uh, watch out for AWS and Azure's like terms of um, terms of service, um, end user license agreements, stuff like that. They don't always like uh, malicious stuff going on in their environments for obvious reasons. So I would uh, I would just be careful. You can throw some stuff in there, but uh, you know make sure what you're doing is on the up and up and and approved by them. Um, and do I use a lot of GUI tools? Another question. And no, not I use whatever tool is best for the job. So I tend to use CLI a lot. Uh, a lot of tools are, are done in CLI. That's just kind of the way hackers are. Um, but for instance, Burp is a um, is a GUI tool, and I use Burp all the time. Any anytime I'm working on a CTF or an engagement, even if I'm not doing web stuff at the moment, uh, I've got Burp running. Um, and I, I've been in situations where I proxy, you know, I proxy stuff through it that isn't traditional web traffic. So that's a, that's a good, Burp is a great example. I think every, you know, most pen testers would agree with that. Um, some people will use like Durbuster, which is a Java tool. Um, I don't typically like it, but you know, it, it's, I think the good, the, the effective, professionals in just about any industry will use the tool that fits the job um, and kind of you kind of lose the the animosity versus like GUI or non GUI Windows versus Linux and all that stuff you kind of lose that as you uh, get better and more effective at what you do because sometimes sometimes you need a hammer and sometimes you need a screwdriver and being super loyal to hammers doesn't do anything but make you less effective overall so um, yeah, uh, that was a good little uh, uh, Q&A uh, diversion, uh, like half time between active and uh, uh, passive and active. But getting back to dig, um, there's one more interest, like amazing tool um, that dig can give you um, if people allow it. And almost no one does, uh, which is great because they shouldn't. Um, the, the and this is this is own transfers. So you can request that a DNS server gives you everything, uh, a DNS server gives you every record it has about something. Um, and sometimes they'll give it to you and sometimes they won't, it depends on how they're configured. Uh, the secure way of doing things is that it won't let you unless you're a very specifically authorized host. Uh, typically their um, secondary, you know, their slave, their DNS slave. Um, but so what that looks like is this. Uh, Let's see, uh, let's see, 
AXFR. So, and if you'll notice immediately it says transfer failed. Now, if it didn't fail, uh, if CrowdStrike was less um, uh, of a good citizen, uh, they, this would basically spit out every record um, that they had, or at least that, that whatever um, uh, server that we, um, that we queried had about CrowdStrike.com. And we can get host information, you know, uh, what hosts are on the network and, or that it has access to and what their IP addresses is, all kinds of great stuff. So um, it's good that this failed. Um, it should fail from a security standpoint, but occasionally and a lot more often once you're already internal to uh, an organization, um, it won't fail. Sometimes some large environments depend on um, uh, zone transfers to, for, for certain functionality to work. So it's a good thing to try. It's, it's very obvious if I were a blue teamer, I would have my logs set up to blare red alert sirens all over the place every time somebody tried to zone transfer, um, for at least from the inside, uh, because that's pretty clear indication that uh, somebody's up to no good. So very much not a stealth thing, uh, but you know can get you some good information. Um, Potty Fake says, someday I make a video giving tips for beginners and pen testing will be nice. Stuck in the learning process. Like what language do I have to learn or something? Um, so that's kind of what this series, this process series is, is an attempt to do. Um, there's no, like, there's no book or a single book or a single checklist that can be like, if you learn these things in this order, you will be a good pen tester because the, the trick to pen testing and, and security in general is knowing a lot about how things work. Uh, and you gain that over time from experience and 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 learning. Um, and there's so much out there that there's no way you're going to learn everything anyway. So um, Dutch Dutch Ghost makes a good point. You know, Python's a great tool uh, to learn, and a lot of people use Python um, before, like way back in the day when you know I was getting cutting my teeth. Um, Perl was the big thing. Nowadays, it seems to be. Uh, Python and Ruby are the are the two big languages, but really just kind of pick something, learn a lot about it, and as you learn about it, you'll find new stuff to learn about, and and you'll just kind of keep going from there. Um, but pen testing and offensive security is a long game. Uh, it's you you can't expect to be an expert pretty much ever. You'll never be an expert. Nobody, I don't think that anybody is an expert in this stuff. There are people that are experts in very specific fields. Um, and very specific technologies, but I don't, there's no one out there, even the, the, the people that I look up to, um, they have like, even they don't know everything. Right. Um, so, but yeah, so to Dutch Ghost's point, um, you learn concepts, um, you know, learn the foundations of things, why things work, how things work. Uh, you know, if you're trying to break something, it's best to know how things are built. Uh, I think, I think, I very strongly believe that the reason that I am effective at this stuff is uh, I came out of Linux administration. I was a Linux administrator for 15 years, uh, so I know a lot about how things are put together and how things work and and how um, environments operate and and how administrators put things together and the shortcuts they take and how, frankly how lazy they are because I know I'm lazy. Uh, so knowing that kind of stuff, um, it helps you identify and kind of start to guess where the, the shortcomings are. So, you know, uh, too long didn't listen version of that is just find something that interests you and learn a lot about it and, and continue to learn a lot about it. Um, the, a good intro class to uh, penetration testing is uh, the penetration testing with Kali Linux by Offensive Security that results in the OSCP um, um, certification it's it's relatively cheap compared to some of the other security training out there and as long as you apply yourself and really do your homework and and go through that book in the lab uh, you will learn a lot about what penetration testing is and a lot of concepts like what i talk about in my videos okay uh water <clears throat> oh yeah over the wire danny 2 k says 
over the wire is a great start. Um, the the bandit and Leviathan um, sections of over the wire are specifically about Linux and just kind of teaching you, um, you know, little things about Linux uh, that are applicable to security. Um, I have um, several videos. I have videos covering all of the the um, bandit and Leviathan levels and explain how they uh, pertain to security and stuff. So you're not just kind of guessing, but um, I would check that out. Uh, buffer overflows are an advanced thing uh, and I'm still learning about them. And I mean, exploit development, like actually developing the exploits is a very niche section of offensive security. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that too much. If you're a developer and that's something or, or that's something that interests you quite a bit, uh, you know, dive into it, jump into it, start reading about it. Um, uh, Hacking in the Art of Exploitation is a great book on that. Um, the the PWK class uh, has some intro into buffer overflow writing. Um, the um, Security 660 from SANS is about exploit writing and, and buffer overflow writing and stuff like that. I just took that class. I'm prepping for that exam now, uh, but that's that's very advanced stuff. So I don't I that I wouldn't worry about that as like you know pen testing 101 or anything like that. Anyways, moving right along, we're oh my gosh, already in an hour, almost an hour. Um, cool. This is going longer than I thought it would. So we're gonna jump into Nmap. Um, and to help demonstrate some concepts on Nmap, I want to, I have another computer here. Um, so we're just going to run TCP dump, uh, on ETH zero. Um, and we'll do host with, just so that we're not seeing a bunch of like crap. What's my IP address here? Uh, I don't have copy paste set up. So 47145. 47145. And just to make sure it works, if we ping it. Four seven one three five. Should see some ICMP packets coming through, which we do. Perfect. Okay, cool. So, uh, let's see. Okay, so so first of all, let's kind of show Nmap just raw for a second. So we're going to do one, two, six, eight, four, seven, one, three, five. So we're just going to Nmap with no, um, no flags or anything, just the standard Nmap against this host. All ports are closed. Okay, but you see this? Nmap throws a ton of um, a ton of packets at something. Like this is insane. This was these three lines of results, uh, or this one line basically saying everything was closed, resulted in all of these packets being thrown at this host. So. First of all, recognize, and this is important, that active recon can be very noisy and very, um, it'll tip your customers off, your clients off um, immediately that something's going on. So if you're trying to be stealthy, Nmap's probably not the way to go, um, but there are some things we can do about that. So what I want to instill in everyone is if you learn about a tool, um, don't just copy and paste how other people use the tool. You need to learn about tools. You need to look at what their capabilities are and what their options are and how to modify them and all of that stuff so that when you come up against something, um, you don't just throw what other people threw at it. You actually do what you should do, right? So let's do a, we did an Nmap minus H. There are a ton of options for Nmap. So um, let's just go through some of these. Uh, let's see, we had some questions here. Um, what are the people I look up to? Man, uh, I keep my Twitter follower or the, the people I follow on Twitter pretty, um, 
pretty clean. I really only follow people that I feel add to the conversation and say interesting things um, just because I don't like to set up a bunch of lists and I don't want to scroll through a bunch of spam. So if you're curious, the, the kind of people that I look up to and the, the people that I, I listen to and, and that I feel are valuable, um, just take a look at who I follow on Twitter. There's a ton of them. Um, Leslie Carhart, the uh, iHacks for Pancakes, um, is amazing um, incident responder and forensicator. Um, uh, Ms. Bat is another amazing incident responder. Um, uh, Swift on security, like is hands down, probably one of the best windows blue teamers that exists. Um, and is also quite funny. Um, Jake Williams is a phenomenal forensicator and, uh, exploit developer. Um, Ed Scotus, I mean, speaks for himself. Uh, Jeff McJunkin, there's a lot of people out there, but as to name a few, that is by no means an exhaustive list. And then Kilo Kilo 6Z Kilo Lima, uh, says, for beginners, I've heard uh, from a lot of industry heavyweights that IT sysadmin roles are a great, great way to learn stuff. Um, I agree. I, I mean, like I said, I was in I was in IT for 15 years before I moved to security, uh, and that is like how I know what I know. Um, I don't have. I now in the last three years have a lot of security training, but before that, it was all just because I came from IT and system administration. I did a little bit of web development. I did a little bit of, you know, a little bit of help desk, a little bit of everything, but um, knowing how these systems work, I can't stress that enough. Knowing how these systems work is what is the most important. That's how you know how things break. So getting back to Nmap, um, we've got a, a lot of, we've got some different kinds of, of scans, right? Uh, different kinds of host discovery, um, diff timings, port scans, all kinds of stuff. So you can just do a ping scan. So you don't do the port scan looking for open ports. Just, this is just real quick. Let's scan uh, a network and, and see what hosts are up. Um, you can skip the ping scan and just do a full port, you know, do the, the rest of the scan and fingerprinting that you have set up below. Uh, without seeing if the host is up. This is useful if you suspect that they are dropping ICMP packets at the edge or uh, the hosts are set to disable uh, or uh, drop ICMP packets in general. Um, you can do things like, um, uh, you've got different kinds of, of scans. You can do a, just throw a SYN uh, at it. Um, you can do, um, just throw an ACK at it. Um, you can do the full, uh, connect. Um, these, these are different types of scans that res will have the targets respond in different ways. Uh, and those will help the more you learn about networking, the more this will make sense, but these, that will help you determine what kind of, um, services are running, what kind of operating systems running in the background. Uh, it can get pop, get by certain types of firewalls. For instance, fi firewalls that aren't super smart, <clears throat> um, but think they are session, um, uh, session aware might see a TCP SYN packet come in, which is the first part of a TCP handshake and say, this guy's trying to initiate a connection. And I was told not to let things initiate connections from that side of, of the firewall. So I'm gonna block it. But if it's not smart, it might see an ACK packet come through and go, oh, this guy's just responding to a session that somebody inside tried to initiate. So I'll let it through. Um, <clears throat> so different different scans will will are used for different types of situations it's but it's again <clears throat> it's important to read the help files to kind of learn about that stuff and see what the capabilities are <clears throat> excuse me uh see what the capabilities are read the help documentation to see how those capabilities work etc body fake says I do not know why, but I use MassScan as my primary scanner. I think MassScan is much faster than Nmap. Like MassScan for scan, all ports is so fast. Uh, that's true. MassScan is generally faster than Nmap. Um, <clears throat> I think that th there's actually a lot of them out there. There's Unicorn Scan. Um, MassScan is another one. That's the one that. Um, uh, um, what is it? That's the one that uh, Shodan uses for the most part is MassScan. Um, there's there's positives and negatives to all of them. Uh, 
certain people use certain ones because that's what they're used to and what they're comfortable with. Um, when I was getting into this stuff, Nmap was the only one that existed. So that's kind of what I use now. It's what I'm comfortable with. It's certainly not the only one I use, uh, but it has a good uh, community development, uh, development community behind it. It's got a large number of scripts. I believe Mascan has a scripting engine as well. I'm not sure if it's, if it's cross compatible to um, the, the, and map scripting engine or not, but it, you know, both of them are valuable. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. If you know how your tool works, um, you can pick the right tool for the job. So there's no, there's no one right answer. Um, but speaking of scripts, so there's, um, the, Nmap has a scripting engine. It uses Lua as its scripting language, um, but there's a ton of currently, like already written scripts for uh, Nmap to run. So if we go to, I think it's user share Nmap. Um, oh yeah, and then if you just go into the scripts, we there's just a ton of there's a ton of scripts available, uh, and I'm not even showing all of them on this 1080p screen. So you know you can see stuff like it'll try and get uh, geolocation for the IP address. You can do um, it's got some uh, you know HTTP enumeration set up already, uh, like ready to to try various things, uh, grab headers, um, you know detect if Drupal's being used. I'm sure there's probably a WordPress one in here. Um, you can do some some DNS enumeration, um, Docker versioning, um, just pretty. There's, there's stuff for everything. SSL detection, uh, you know, heart bleed detection, all kinds of stuff. So it's well worth kind of becoming familiar with what exists. Uh, but you can do stuff like um, if we do stuff like let's throw up a web server over here. If we do something like Python uh, 3mhp.server, so we've got a web server. And if you're not familiar with the fact that Python can run just a module, um, that Python can just run like a module and a one-liner, and that you can stand up like HTTP servers or FTP servers and all that stuff just like on the blink of an eye from Python, um, definitely. Um, definitely figure that out and learn this learn this stuff because the amount of times that i host something with like just python if i have access to python three or two um like and, and i use that to curl or wget or host up you know malicious files or whatever uh it's it's just amazing so uh and then we'll just uh echo um foobar into the uh robots txt and we'll echo bar foo into index.html so so if we do dash dash script equals uh, and we do HTTP like that. So this is going to grab every HTTP uh, module that exists, every HTTP script that is in this directory and run it against this um, file or this host. And we can actually, um, we'll, just to make this go faster, we're going to specify specifically that we want it running against port 80 only. Um, yeah. Okay, good. So and if we go back to this, we should be seeing, yeah, look at all of this crap coming through. Uh, we see a ton of requests coming into our um, into our web server. So it's looking for WordPress. It's looking for um, it's trying to see if it has just like random uh, local file includes, um, seeing if it can get Etsy password, Etsy shadow. Um, these are all common things that are, are common vulnerabilities and known uh, vulnerable software is generally what's happening here. Uh, and while that's running, let me catch up on these questions here. So, um, pseudo man, man says, have you ever accidentally crashed a router scanning it? Uh, I have not, uh, specifically for the router. Um, I have crashed hosts in the past, uh, generally small, like, um, embedded systems or, 
you know, like single use, like Linux embedded systems that uh, don't respond well to um, malformed packets. Uh, generally, Nmap uses and most scanners use like malformed packets uh, to, to detect what operating system and services are running because each operating service or operating system and service kind of respond to um, malformed stuff differently. Their error codes will be slightly different or their TTLs on response packets will be slightly different. Like all this stuff uh, helps Nmap kind of determine uh, what it's dealing with. Uh, and so some small systems just aren't prepared for that kind of stuff and will crash. Um, another thing is timing, and we'll get into timing in a second, but if you flood it, especially with something like mass scan that's capable of flooding really fast, um, you can literally just DOS a denial of service a device off the network, um, which can be pretty scary. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, you have to know what you're doing, right? And I mean, that's kind of the the moral of the story is uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna let this go. Um, let's do so. Anyways, if you do the star, you can um, you can do that. You can also do something like, uh, and I just found this out the other day. You can do um, like BPF style filters. So you can do I want all uh, HTTP or all things that start with HTTP dash, uh, but we also don't want uh, HTTP brute. So uh, if we look up here, there will be HTTP dash brute. So there's this one script here, and we don't want that one specifically. Um, so using that filter, now we're just running everything but that. And if you notice, we're already at 18. Well, yeah, we're already at like 5% when it took us, you know, 15 minutes to get to the 5.26. Anyways, so again, we're not going to do this. Um, what we will run is we will run a minus capital A. Um, what minus capital A does is it just runs all the default scripts. There's scripts in this directory that are just marked as default. Uh, and so we'll run all of the default scripts, which are a subset of things, against port 80 only. And this should run a little bit faster. Um, Danny 2K says, I just switched uh, from our support team to our operations team, and my goal is to end up in some kind of security role, take some time, at least to start my journey. And that's important. Uh, yeah. Um, and from an operations perspective, you can go from, uh, you know, knock operations or, or help desk operations into SOC operations, the security operations center, um, start doing analysis. Um, at first, you'd probably just start responding to like IDS alerts and and uh, malware, tra you know, malware um, protection alerts and stuff like that. But as you you know gain experience and you get exposed to more stuff, you'll start moving up and getting exposure to more and more stuff. Uh, and that's that's just how this whole thing works. So yeah, that's a great step. Uh, come on. Did we crash this over here? I wonder if we cra Oh, we must have crashed it. Oh yeah, I think the um, I think Python died. There we go. Yeah, so if we if we see here, you know, we're getting we're getting responses from the actual thing. So uh, we did a get request, and we just see barfu sitting in the index, uh, right? It's doing things like trying to figure out like what options are supported, options isn't supported. Um, it's getting a bunch of of garbage back from the Python script because the Python script isn't set up to understand different methods and all that. Um, but you can kind of see how some of this works. And we're getting more information out of uh, Nmap than we were just from the standard uh, the standard scan. So scripts are useful. Scripts are important. You know, again, just kind of look through what scripts are available for the, the services that you're enumerating, that you're reconning. Um, 
you know, SMB is another good one. If you found an SMB service, there's a lot of like SMB enumeration scripts that can help you find what information is, um, you know, what, like what files are being hosted on the SMB shares, what shares are available. You can enumerate users through SMB, all kinds of cool stuff. So, um, yeah, the scripts, scripts are super important, uh, super important to learn. And if you do something like, um, um, let's see if we, what if we just like, we want to BI brute. We'll take a look at brute itself, right? So, you know, if you know Lua and I don't, but if you know Lua, you can start, you know, reading through this and kind of seeing what, um, you know, what is, uh, what's going on and what the script is doing. Now I do know a little bit about computers, so I can kind of make some educated guesses on what's going on. So what this looks like is that it's saying if a host has uh, 80 or 443 available um, and that the service is HTTP or HTTPS as a TCP open, not closed, uh, then, you know, like maybe you can run this script against it. This would be a valid script to run against it. Now, if we knew that we also wanted, you know, port 8080 and 8443 and 1443 and all these other common TCP ports, uh, then we could, you know, this, the script wouldn't fire, but we can modify it, right? We can, we can customize these scripts to do what we want them to do. It's a beautiful thing about computers is, is we can make them do what we want them to do. Um, even if they're not originally uh, set up to do that. And that's that's why it's so important to learn everything you can, really. Um, let's see, what else uh, for Nmap? Oh, so another couple important things about Nmap. So um, Nmap has some output uh, options. So different output formats. You can output an XML, uh, which is really only used it when you're importing nmap output into other tools like metasploit can take uh, nmap xml output and uh, load it into its internal database um, greppable formats good for if you just want to like quick you know one line dissect some some uh, nmap output uh, if you want to find every host that has like an open port 80 it's a lot easier to just grep from the greppable format you know the 80 open uh, and it'll give you each host. Um, you know, the um, the ON is just the normal NMAP output that you normally get just put out to a file. So uh, you can do something like uh, capital OA. And what that does, as you can see here, is that it'll do um, the XML, the NMAP, and the greppable format um, all. So that's typically what I'll do so that I have access to whatever I need later. I don't have to go, oh my God, I have to go back and rescan it. Um, yeah, yeah, it's got a script kitty format where it just, uh, let's do this. Um, oh my god, there. Okay, and then we'll just, oh, what is it, OS? Yeah. Requires an argument. Oh, right. Uh, when you do these, you have to put a, a name in. So if you do OA, it won't do the script kitty format, uh, but it'll use your name as the base, and then it'll be like, it'll be, uh, you know, base name dot. Um, uh, GN map base name dot X uh, N map stuff like that. So here we actually give it a file name. So we'll do lulz. Uh, actually, let's let's go here and then we'll make their uh, recon. And then we'll um, uh, so we'll N map one nine two one six eight. 47.135 and we'll OS um, skiddy.nmap. Yeah, so it just, you know, it, it all it does is it replaces some things with other things and then randomly capitalizes and stuff. Um, Dutch Ghost, yeah, so I'm using just the, the standard. Um, Kali terminal, and then I use tmux for my multiplexing, so I can do stuff like um, uh, I can, you know, tile things um, so that I have multiple terminals. Um, I've got a um, I've got a, a specific um, bash setup in my profile um, so that it um, 
so that it, this is so that it looks like this, so that I can see. You know, I, I like that it has the time. Ha ha ha! That's funny. Um, you can't even plan that shit. But um, I like seeing the time, so that I, you know, I know roughly how long things took. You know, looking back at things. Um, you know what my user is, what my host name is, what my file path is. Uh, and then I put my prompt down on the next line in case this file path gets really long. I still I can still see the whole file path and have uh, reasonable room to type. But so that's that. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, oh, well, one last thing and map. So uh, let's see. You can do IPv6 scanning. I think that's um, experimental, or maybe it's not anymore. But um, last thing that's important. So timing. We mentioned earlier somebody saying, "Oh, you can, um, you know, you can knock stuff over uh, using Nmap." Or, um, you know, I also mentioned that, as we saw here, um, yeah. as we saw here, you generate just a ton of packets very quickly, and it's very easy to detect when stuff like that happens. So you can set up timing here. Um, higher is faster, zero through five. I believe default is like three. Um, so you can set it to zero to, to, it'll increase the time it takes to scan. And I mean, we're talking on a big scan, it can take days. Um, but if you're scanning, you know, the perimeter of a, of a customer, a, you know, a customer of which you have permission to scan the perimeter of, um, they will have a ton of logs just because of the internet, right? The internet's always doing crazy stuff. They have legitimate traffic, they have non-legitimate traffic, et cetera. Uh, and if you slow your scan down, um, enough uh you can um you can kind of blend into that background noise right the background noise of the internet so um some ideas will have like timing thresholds like if if a single host sends me like three thousand packets within one second then block them or alert or something like that um then you know you can lower yourself below those thresholds dutch ghost has to go um I don't know if we'll still be here in half an hour, but like I said, this this stream will go up on video um, later, so you know you can come back and see what you missed. Um, so yeah, the uh, timing's important. You know, lower your timing if you're worried about uh, tripping IDS. If you're worried about knocking things over, um, you know, read through these options and kind of see, um, you know, what what stuff's available to you. You can run it through proxies. Um, you can try and spoof your source address. You can do all kinds of stuff, um, but you have to know how how they work and what they're doing so that you know you don't spoof your source address and then never get any of the results back, right? So um, that is Nmap. So we're going to move along to uh, Nikto, which is another um, another web scanner. We're going to go ahead and let's close this. Okay, we got that back up. Good, good, good. Okay, so Nikto is another um, a, a, another scanner. It's you know very noisy. It's a web scanner for like web apps and stuff. Um, we'll just run real quick. Um, we'll run this real quick just so you kind of see how it works and kind of what the output is. Um, so it's already seeing a bunch of stuff, right? Like it doesn't it doesn't see that there's the anti-click jacking header. Um, it doesn't see that there's no access, uh, XSS protection. Uh, it tells you what type of server it is. Uh, it sees a bunch of stuff in the directory. Um, says uh, that it doesn't recognize the server header. Do we want to update? And we could update. We're not going to. Um, but you can see that it's it's finding a bunch of stuff, you know, and it can, as with most scanners, it can find, you know, default uh, files that it's looking for. Uh, you know, it can look for, you know, login.txt or, you know, um, you know, a test endpoint or something like that. Um, it'll do some generic subdirectory brute forcing. Uh, nothing like what Durbuster or Derby will do with uh, dictionaries. I believe Nikto can take a dictionary. Let's find out. So we can list the plugins. By default, it runs all of the plugins, but we probably don't want to do that. Um, so we can take a look at plugins. Um, and you can go through the plugins and see which ones you want and which ones you don't. 
uh, again, to kind of lower the amount of noise that you're generating by these tools. So speaking of noise, let's take a look at how much crap we just sent at this server. We just sent a ton of stuff at the server, a bunch of stuff that doesn't even make sense, right? Um, we could do one get request to this thing and find and realize that it's not, um, you know, Drupal or WordPress or anything like that, right? So we could go in in that list of plugins and specify the ones that aren't Drupal and WordPress and all of these other frameworks that it's going to be testing. I mean, look at all this stuff that it sent. So right about right about here is where the Nikto started, right? Right here. So from here down, all of this stuff is a single Nikto scan. It's very noisy. So once again, take a look at the help. Um, look at what the tool is doing. Look at the way you can customize the tool to not be as noisy or to not knock things over or to you know fit what you want to do. Um, another cool thing about Nikto, um, so there's some tuning stuff that you can set. You can, where is it? You can set a uh, login if you need, if you need creds. Uh, you can set a specific config file. I believe that's where you set um, like what um, user agent you're going to use. Another thing, if you notice, um, oh, we don't list the whole thing here. If we listed, if we enumerated out the whole uh, request, we'd see that the user agents like Nikto something or other. Uh, and obviously, I, I'm sure you could imagine that like every firewall and IDS known to man is set to go off like crazy if it sees something like Nikto or or Nmap or um, you know Derby or whatever. So it's important when you're using like web scanners and web enumerators to. Um, you know, set the, the user agent to something else uh, or not. Sometimes you're trying to get caught in a, in a pen test, right? You've, you've gotten everything you need uh, and, you know, you, now you want to start testing like where their defenses are, like at where you would have been caught. So you can say, okay, here's where your border is now. Here are things you can do to kind of increase your detection capability. So sometimes you want to get caught. Sometimes you want to use these noisy tools, but you won't know when you will and won't get caught if you don't know how these uh, tools work. So let's see. So the last one in the active uh, set is a tool called Aquatone. And evidently what Aquatone is, um, is it, it's an old Lockheed Martin um, uh, spy plane or something like that. Um, but so this tool is a, um, is a basically a web enumerator. Uh, Oh, discover, not discovery. There we go. Okay, so this is a tool used to enumerate web hosts, um, find you know certificates and subdomains and hosts and and all kinds of stuff. It's a it's a web, it's literally a web recon tool. Uh, it has plugins for numerous things. It'll look at that cert.sh site that we looked at earlier today. Uh, it'll do some some brute force enumeration against the target itself. Um, we'll start this and then so that you can see some of the, uh, some of the output, but then we'll stop it because it actually takes forever. Um, uh, and, but I've already, this is one of the few times I'll actually do this, but I've already ran it once. It took like an hour and a half. Um, but I have the output from the command so we can take a look at the output, like once it's done. Uh, but so we'll just run this against the CrowdStrike. So... Uh, it checked uh, something called Threat Crowd. It checked something called Netcraft. Um, there's Census, uh, which I don't have an API key for, so it didn't work. Um, there was some sort of error with PTR Archive. I don't have a Virus Total API key, so it stopped. Um, it did Certificate Search. That's the cert.sh that we already looked at, plus uh, some other things. So now it's doing some public dub 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 searching. And this is where it takes forever. So we'll go ahead and stop this. What happens is it'll go through uh, all of these services. It'll find a list of um, potential names and IP addresses, and then it'll go through and try and resolve those names and IP addresses to each other. And what that will look like is um, 
it'll come out and look like this. So again, this is a much more exhaustive list, or maybe not. No, this is probably about the same list as what um, what we got earlier from the cert.sh, or very close to it. Um, but again, we see that there's you know the there's the IMAP. Um, here's a pop address, um, something called Venom. It was probably from that uh, from that Venom uh, vulnerability that came out a while ago. Um, you know, something called CF Falcon. So all kinds of hosts that we and IP addresses that we can then load those IP addresses into, you know, Nmap or uh, some other scanner that we want to use to kind of learn more about it. Uh, additionally, we can uh, believe it's also in JSON. So depending on how you want to uh, automate through that list, whether you want to use Python to enumerate through JSON or you want to use like, you know, just bash to go through a um, just a list of of you know, a, a text file. Uh, it's all up to you. They, those are the two outputs they give you. Um, Aquatone has a couple other modules that do things like um, uh, actually scan. So it'll take this list of, of hosts and then it'll actually scan these hosts uh, using common uh, web uh, ports. So, you know, 8443, obviously, but also 8080, 8443, um, 180 or you know 1080 10443 like all of those ones that like tom cattle use and and everybody uses kind of as like the default um test ones before they get moved into 80 and, and 443 uh it'll scan for all of those and then build another list for you with like okay this this ip address this host name has 80 80 80 and 84 or 8443 on it uh and so it'll generate that list for you and then it'll have a it has a, another module that'll start doing like uh, URL endpoint brute forcing. So it'll go through this list um, of IP addresses and ports. Uh, and for every IP address port pair, it'll look for, um, you know, web content for you uh, that you can then sort through. Uh, so it's a pretty awesome tool. There's a lot to it. Uh, and again, the scans take a long time. So um, unlike normal, I won't actually go through the whole the whole process of running the tool, but um, it kind of gives you an idea of, of what kind of information you'll get from it. So there's one last tool that I want to go over, uh, and we're already in an hour and a half, um, but hopefully this tool won't take too long. Uh, but it's, it's very important when you're talking about recon. It's basically one of the de facto's, and it's a tool called Recon NG. And so you'll notice immediately, before I get too far into this, you'll notice immediately I get a huge ton, like I, uh, just a ton of red text saying like, you don't have API keys set up. That is because these are all different services that different recon ng modules will work with to try and gather information about targets. So, you know, you can use Bing, LinkedIn, uh, GitHub, Shodan, uh, Pwnedless, um, you know, Google APIs for Google searching, uh, Twitter, all kinds of stuff. Facebook, I believe, is in there somewhere. Um, so, you know, these are all services that you can get API keys for and help enumerate with. Um, but Recon NG in general was uh, is written by Tim Tomes, um, obviously sponsored by Black Hills InfoSec. Uh, that's John Strand's organization. Um, but this is a Metasploit framework-esque um, Recon framework. It's 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 used for enumerating stuff, just like what we've seen before. So much like, um, oops, uh, much like uh, uh, Metasploit, it has tab complete. So we can type sh, uh, and we can see that we have shell or show. Um, now just show, and then uh, what do we type after show? We have no idea, so we hit tab, and it'll show us the different verbs or different um, commands that we can do after show. What we want to show. Uh, so maybe we want to show modules, uh, and maybe we want to show, you know, recon modules, or, yeah, sorry, we show modules, uh, and then we want to show recon modules, and it'll just list out all the recon modules. Now that's silly, because we just got all the modules here, right? Um, but so these are all different recon modules that we can use. There's other types of modules. Um, like discovery, exploitation, these are kind of less used. They're, they're not the focus of Recon NG, uh, but they are there. Um, you can import CSVs and stuff like that too. But so if we want to, um, let's use, um, we'll use Recon 
domain hosts and since we kind of did this before um since we we've been doing the whole like enumerating hosts uh, we'll just continue that theme uh, and we'll do certificate transparency, which is likely going to be using that cert.sh one again in the past. So we can also do a show info that shows us what's going on. Uh, yeah, so certificate transparency data from cert.sh. Uh, so it'll help us enumerate hosts. So it'll likely give us the same information we saw before, but another way to get it, another tool. Um, and obviously, again, this tool has many other modules for it. This is another one of those tools, sort of like Shodan, which um, Recon NG can I can spend hours and hours just on this tool alone. So I'm not going to do that here. This uh, this video is more about just Recon in general. Maybe someday I'll start doing you know like you know full streams just for each tool. But I feel like we have a lot of ground to cover before we're at that level of granularity. And there's uh, tons of material already written about you know, Recon NG and, and various other like Nmap and books written about Nmap. So uh, we won't get too far into it, but just as a demonstration on how this kind of works, right? Um, we can add domain. So again, if we, um, if we're working on a client, say, you know, say we're actually doing a bug bounty on for CrowdStrike, which we're not, but say we are, um, rather than typing in, you know, what our target is every time or, um, you know, in Metasploit, it would be the our hosts or our host, you know, typing that in every time. We can actually just add a domain and we'll say, okay, and we want to add CrowdStrike.com. Um, and then if we um, run this uh, this module, it runs it just against CrowdStrike.com automatically. So we don't have to, again, if we were to move to a different module, CrowdStrike would already be there. CrowdStrike.com would already be there. Uh, so we got this, we got this list. Uh, these things, you know, um, we got a bunch of, you know, uh, wildcard domains and these assets and, and stuff like that. But, you know, this isn't a, a super great way to, to read this stuff. So, um, so one of the cool things about Recon NG, much like Metasploit and similar tools, is that it's got an internal database that it, it kind of runs and it keeps track of all this data for you. So we can just run show hosts. Show host, right? Yeah. And so from show host, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, but from show host, it'll give us a, a table of the different hosts that it found. And then using other recon ng modules, um, we can, this will, it'll fill in the IP addresses, the region, you know, the latitude and longitude if it's got geo IP uh, modules that we run on it, stuff like that. So, um, the recon ng is kind of separate from, I, I didn't include it in the passive and the active section specifically because, uh, certain modules will be passive like this one. This one uses cert.sh certain modules might be, uh, active. It might, uh, you know, actually hit like Aquatone. It might actually hit the web servers and brute force information about it. Uh, trying to pull, um, you know, email enumeration is something that Recon NG can do for you. But some of that will be it reaching out to web servers and finding email addresses, you know, on the web pages and whatnot. So again, as the, the constant theme of this, this section, this, uh, this phase is you, it's important to know what your tool is doing. Um, and specifically in the recon phase where it's, it's very important to know if you're being, if you're doing passive or active recon, um, it's important to know how your tool is going to operate and what side of that line it's going to be on. And additionally, how, if it's active, how noisy, how active is it? Like how loud is it going to be on the wire? So hopefully this gave you a lot to think about. Hopefully as we move through the next couple of phases, this will help set up a kind of framework for you to move through CTF challenges or war game challenges or, you know, certification tests or whatever, it'll give you this kind of framework of, okay, in the, in the recon phase, this is kind of the stuff we do. And this is the information that I'm trying to get. These are some of the tools that I can use. And then we'll move in and talk about how exploitation can work and um, how, you know, uh, like the enumeration phase should work and stuff like that. And we can build really this kind of good process because the Lord knows I could use more process in my life. It's, it's, it's kind of frustrating sometimes to beat my head against something for like four hours and then remember this trick that I do all the time and be like, well, I could have solved this in five minutes if I would have, if I would have moved down a checklist and remembered this thing that I normally do. 
So process is important, kids. Um, you know, keep it up. Um, the best hackers in the world do not do things uh, by accident. They do it on purpose, and uh, they do it because they have their own processes and their own workflows in place. So thanks for joining me. I had a good time. Hopefully it will not be another month before I do this again, but I've got some talks that I'm working on, and I've been pretty busy at work. So hopefully uh, I'll have some cool announcements soon. Uh, I have a talk, a webcast coming up on the SANS uh, webcast series uh, coming up at the end of March. So keep an eye on Twitter for that. I've already posted a couple times, but um, thanks for joining me and uh, we'll see you next time.